The more time I spent with Banisher's Ghosts of New Eden, the less I found myself enjoying it. The game has a fantastic setting, a pair of great protagonists, and a few moments of excellence, but these are not enough to make it worth wading through everything else the game does poorly. I had high hopes for Banisher, so these being my concluding feelings towards the game is extremely disappointing as well as confusing because in a lot of ways it feels like Banisher's was made for me, like I was the target audience. The game is about being a ghost hunter in colonial America, and this idea alone was enough to hook me. But then it takes the gameplay of God of War, the character concept of The Witcher, the atmosphere of the 2015 film The Witch, David Beckham's Man Bun, and throws them all into the oven as well. I greatly enjoy each of these, so in theory Banisher's Ghost of New Eden should be a slam dunk for me, but it's actually these influences and a lack of understanding as to why they work in those other forms that is a big part of why this game fails in my eyes. The other part is that not only are these inspirations poorly executed, but they appear to have come at the cost of completely wiping away the studio's own identity from the product. Banisher's Ghost of New Eden was released in February of 2024 and developed by Don't Not Entertainment. It is their second attempt at making a game in the action RPG genre, with the first being 2018's Vampire. You likely wouldn't be able to tell these two games were developed by the same studio, however, as they share almost nothing in common outside of their tedious and often joyless combat. Vampire, despite its many flaws, however, was a game that attempted to create something new within the genre. In it, the developers crafted a unique system revolving around the game's many NPCs. The player as a vampire could drain and kill the citizen NPCs as a massive and reliable source of experience points for leveling up as well as high value equipment. Doing so, however, would also hurt the health of the community as well as create ripple effects among the victim's closest ties, potentially creating even more issues. The game walked a fine line between trying to entice players to make morally gray choices while also actually having consequences for those choices within the game, not just in the final cutscene. It wasn't always successful, but it at least charted its own course. With Banishers, rather than expand on and iterate on these same mechanics, the studio Don't Nod has largely stripped most of them away in order to settle into a more straightforward and mass-appealing RPG experience. In my opinion, the game is a big step backwards in many ways from Vampire and only a few baby steps forward and that's if I'm being generous. You are dispensed a quest from the NPCs, you follow a map marker to a nearby location, you fight enemies along the way or once you reach the spot, you are then spoon-fed the information you need and you arrive back at the quest giver. This format isn't inherently bad but it is made worse by the other design decisions within the game. I played through the game twice, once on Very Hard, the game's highest difficulty, and then once again on Story, the game's easiest difficulty, in order to see the other outcome or consequences for many of the game's choices. The vast majority of my over 85 hours of playing this game felt like a chore, and I am someone who has put 188 hours into Baldur's Gate 3 and am still happily going. I have put over 150 hours into The Witcher 3, and while it gets a bit long in the tooth towards the end, I still actively enjoy the experience. These are games that I will undoubtedly continue to revisit throughout my life. I would be shocked, however, if I ever touch Banishers again. This sounds quite harsh, but this is genuinely how I feel. It's not a buggy and broken train wreck, but it'd almost be easier if it was. I've seen so many reviews or discussions about how good this game is outside of its combat and I couldn't disagree more. Yes, its combat is bad, but so are many, many other parts of this game. The traversal, the map size, the constant climbing up walls or squeezing through cracks. 
the constant, unskippable combat encounters, the repeating, unskippable cutscenes, the absolutely awful enemy variety, the lackluster build diversity, the frankly boring filler side content, the poorly thought out combat challenges, the fact that your choices don't actually matter outside of the ending cutscene, almost everything in this game. What's worse is that all of these awful pieces are dressed in an absolutely fantastic and interesting world. I enjoyed reading the lore documents, I enjoyed walking through the environments, and I enjoyed the feeling that there was more to this world than what I was seeing. These are important because despite my negative feelings on Banishers, I still want the studio Don't Not Entertainment to continue working within this genre. I think they are further away from the goalposts with this release, but Don't Not is close to making something truly remarkable. It just feels like with Banishers they copied other recently successful games without actually having the understanding of why they were successful in the first place. And that's what the rest of this video is about, more thoroughly exploring Banishers' identity and design problems. I spoil the main narrative of the game, although know that I'm offering this warning out of courtesy rather than because I think it's truly necessary. The story of Banishers has very little to even spoil, but I understand there are many people who like to be warned and I want to respect that. One additional warning followed by one recommendation. I discussed the ending of the game quite early and before any of the other major choices in the game, so if you're someone who is only partially through the game as you watch this, you've been warned. Finally, if you think Banishers is something you might like, then I can't recommend highly enough to play this game on the lowest difficulty, the one called Story. The game's problems will still be there, but at least the combat will be simply boring, as opposed to tedious. Let me be sure I understand. You killed my sister, and now you're asking me for payment. Banishers Ghosts of New Eden takes place in the year 1695 and is centered on a large-scale curse or haunting that is impacting the New England town of New Eden. First, there was pestilence and disease. Then came the nightmares. Then came madness. In the end came death. And death remains. But in all honesty... <laughs> I think the weather is the worst part. This never-ending winter hangs heavy on us all. Worse yet, it traps us here. You play as Red McWraith and Antea Duarte, a pair of ghost hunters known as Banishers. They have been contracted to help put an end to the curse, and the very beginning of the game sees their arrival to the area in the early summer of 1695. Depending on how much you know about the region's history, or perhaps remember from reading the novel The Crucible in school if you're from the States, 1695 is just three years after the same area underwent the infamous Salem Witch Trials. This period was a dark one for the state of Massachusetts, centered on the town of Salem. Due to disagreements between the residents as well as stresses related to the time period, the small community of Salem historically spiraled into hysteria as individuals began accusing others of practicing witchcraft. And because this was before modern trial protocol, many accused individuals had no defense other than to accuse someone else, so accusations and the hysteria just continued on and on. 19 people were wrongly killed due to this tragedy, with around three-fourths of them being women. I'm spending time explaining all of this here because while we don't know it until later in the game, Banisher's main narrative is centered on an individual named Deborah who was falsely accused, imprisoned, and then later horrifically executed on suspicion of being a witch. The trauma and injustice inflicted by this series of events has not only caused her spirit to linger, but has transformed it into a powerful subspecies of specter known as a nightmare. 
The curse that the region is experiencing is directly related to Deborah's desire for vengeance against those responsible, particularly those individuals in positions of power. The game's story on the surface has quite a lot of potential. You are essentially a supernatural detective working to uncover the truth of what caused the nightmare, then resolve its issues and give it closure. The game unfortunately doesn't deliver on much of this promise in an interesting way in my opinion, but we'll return to that later. Banisher's setting and world are the game's greatest strengths and will be what I look back on the most fondly. It's a largely underutilized time period across all fiction, not just in video games. It was a deeply religious and superstitious time for the colonies, so basing the game's setting and identity on these historic realities with a supernatural flair works quite well. It was also a time period where the colonists were doing exactly that, colonizing and as such there are many deeply ugly and horrific actions undergone by the settlers in order to take the land from the indigenous tribes. It's also a period of time where slavery was still a thing, women's rights were non-existent, and religion informed who you could love. This time period's ugliness was at least in part why I was excited for this game. The developer's previous game, Vampire, was great at creating scenarios within its citizen system that often weren't as simple as they appeared and often had unintended side effects. The NPC citizens were also directly tied to that game's leveling system, adding another layer of complexity that players needed to think about when making decisions. With Banisher's focus on grief, the dead haunting the living, and in combination with the setting and time period, I believed it would be perfect for complex ghost cases about all this ugliness. Having completed Banisher's Ghosts of New Eden twice now, and upon further reflection, I now understand that I was wrong about this, and in fact I would go so far as to now say that I believe the opposite is true. That this setting is likely one of the worst you could possibly do if your intention is to have morally grey choices. This is because it's quite difficult to present a scenario where a slave, for example, could feel as much a villain as the person who believes they own them. Or a beaten wife compared to her abuser. Or an American Indian and the individual who helped kill her tribe. I'm not saying complex cases can't be done, the game does have a couple cases that I consider close to the level of complexity I was originally hoping for, but rather what I'm saying is that it's incredibly difficult to thoughtfully craft this complexity. And Don't Nod Entertainment likely came to this realization themselves, as they largely shy away from presenting any sort of morally grey situations within the game, particularly with the side quests that are focused on the mini citizens of this new colony. Let's dig deeper into these side quests because they illustrate why the game feels devoid of the very thing that made Vampire so special in my opinion, the choices and consequences created by its citizen and embracing system. These gameplay systems tracked the social connections between the NPCs, the overall region or community health, the information you had gathered about each individual, as well as any consequences that had occurred from killing them to feed your vampiric hunger. On the surface, Banishers appears to replicate these systems. Throughout the main narrative, you will find yourself in three small communities, each containing around a dozen NPCs and a leader among them. The leaders each have a role in the main narrative, but all of the other NPCs are there as side content. If you've played Vampire, you're probably nodding along because this all sounds familiar. In Banishers, the NPC citizens found throughout the region are all suffering from some sort of haunting, meaning a ghost lingers essentially attached to them due to a connecting tie or event. The game refers to these side quests as haunting cases. Lore-wise, if left unattended to, the ghosts become a parasite, slowly absorbing the essence of the living until they kill them. 
Given enough time, the ghosts also lose their own identity and become mindless specters, like the enemies fought throughout the game. To be clear, this doesn't actually happen in-game, but I just wanted to explain what happened in-universe. This is where Banishers, the professionals, are brought in. Their job is to investigate why the ghost remains, let it air its grievances, and then bring closure to the case, for both the living and the dead. The closure portion of this involves making a decision and players are given three options here. Banish, Ascend, or Blame. Banish and Ascend are selections made for the ghost. Banish condemns the spirit to the void, which is basically hell, for eternity, and Ascend is the opposite. You allow the spirit to peacefully move on. The final option, blame, is only for the living. You blame the individual for the events that cause the ghost to remain. You absorb their essence, killing them and freeing the spirit from its earthly bonds. So, one of these is not like the others, and it's probably not the one you're thinking. Both Banish and Blame are pointing the finger and finding fault in someone, whereas Ascend you avoid finger pointing and instead just help both parties move on. These likely sound like a good selection for the player to choose from, and I originally thought they were as well, but it becomes quickly apparent that there's not many scenarios where banishing the ghost makes more sense than ascending it. This goes back to that morally grey complexity I mentioned earlier that the game is lacking. Most of the cases don't present any sort of malicious intention on the ghost's part, so condemning them to hell through banishing feels extreme when contrasted against the gentler option. The game implies early on that perhaps ascending a ghost isn't always a safe or permanent option, but unless I missed something, this line is a red herring. In my first playthrough, I strictly played the role of a banisher, never blaming any of the living individuals and ascending almost all of the ghosts. I never encountered any consequences for those choices, which is a shame. Having repercussions for being a bleeding heart could have made providing closure in each case more thought-provoking and require players to think more carefully about the ghost's intentions, something the game incorporates already but doesn't do anything interesting with. I actually think the choices the game wants to offer would have been better if ascending a ghost wasn't an option at all. Force players to choose between blaming or banishing. Force them to make a choice and to be potentially uncomfortable making that choice. It would also better take advantage of a mechanic the game has where banished ghosts can later appear as mini-bosses while traveling through the void. It's a great idea that ends up toothless due to no real reason to banish in the first place as well as the horrendous enemy variety, what could have and should have been unique and difficult encounters that only occur due to your choices ends up becoming lost in the game's sea of bland and monotonous combat. Now, Ascent only exists as an option because of the main narrative. See, Banishers Banish Ghosts. That much makes sense, it's in the name. However, banishing can't be the only gameplay option for dealing with ghosts because then it complicates a choice that players must make during the story. In the prologue, one half of our Banisher pair is killed, Antea Duarte. She is quickly found again as a spirit, and the pair discuss their options forward. This might seem strange that there's a conversation here because, well, banishers banish ghosts, but this discussion occurs because Red and Antea aren't just ghost-hunting partners, but also lovers. A fact that must have been particularly frustrating for neighbors who would have had to discern if any moaning they heard was coming from ghosts or the bedroom. This early conversation presents two options, either give Antea her ascent or attempt to resurrect her through an ancient ritual. Both require her body to complete, which is still with the nightmare in New Eden Town, and so this becomes the primary reason as to why the pair need to solve the curse caused by the nightmare. Now, banishing Antea is not an option, despite her being a ghost, and this is actually addressed by the characters. I'm a ghost. You're a banisher. I'll not banish you. I cannot, Antea. So you die. You can't ask that of me. 
If that's what I wanted, you'd have no choice. It makes sense that Red would act and think this way. Given his time in this profession, he knows that banishing Antea would condemn her to the void, but that itself would have presented a more interesting choice than what we're given. To resurrect Antea, she needs to absorb the life essence of living individuals, meaning that players will have to blame and kill many of the citizens they meet for that essence, sacrificing them in order to bring her back. On the other hand, there are no special requirements to ascend her. The two solve the nightmare case together and she leaves peacefully. Red is in grief, but it's a healthy grief, mourning the loss of someone he loved. It's the option that the developers want you to choose, it's safe, it's bittersweet. The bigger issue is that this main narrative decision to resurrect or ascend will inform and control all of the choices you make throughout the game. After the first introductory haunting case, Red and Antea once again discuss if they should ascend or resurrect her, and you the player are given a prompt on screen. As Red, you are asked to swear an oath to Antea on which of these two fates you are choosing, and while the game states that you are free to make any choice you want and even gives a chance to change course about a third of the way into the game, the way the information is presented around these choices suggests otherwise. The game gives a warning at the closure for every haunting case about how if Red wants to bring Antea back to life, he must blame the largest number of living settlers. Notice that there isn't a specific number stated, and this has to be intentional. Players don't know how many people they must blame, and so many people's natural inclination will be to just go all in, blame every single living individual because you can't risk it not working. Blame and finger point like one of us damn millennials. Tying the game's final outcome to the decisions made in these cases effectively removes any incentive for players to play the banisher on a case-by-case -case basis. This is something that Vampyr unfortunately did as well, which indicates to me that Studio Don't Nod didn't learn their lesson the first time. However, it's worse here. Vampyr at least had the interesting mechanic of your level and experience points being tied to if you were willing to embrace and kill citizens or not. The game was made more or less difficult by your choice. Banishers doesn't do this even though it easily could as well. The spirit points used to specifically level up Antea's abilities could have been locked behind blaming, or if that's too extreme, choosing that option could have generated a larger amount versus banishing or ascending. This would allow the player to unlock more abilities and quicker, connecting how powerful you feel directly to the killing of haunted citizens. It would still be a band-aid to the problem as it doesn't remove the incentive to just do playthroughs for each morality choice, but it at least makes choices more impactful throughout the entire game instead of just the last 10 minutes. All of this is ultimately just pissing into the wind though. Difficult choices don't matter if you don't have interesting scenarios in the first place, and the haunting cases here are mostly just okay. Many don't have moral complexity, and most actually have pretty vanilla scenarios. I've said that a couple of times in this video so far, so I think it's important to show some examples to back this up. But I want to start positive with what I consider the best haunting case in the game, because seeing how good this side quest is illustrates how poor many of the others are by comparison. The case, titled Through a Glass Darkly, is centered on the Bly estate and is so unlike anything else found in the game that I'm convinced the developers didn't realize what they had with it. I consider it the single best hour of content that the game has to offer, and it reinforces that the game should have gone for quality with its haunting cases over quantity had less overall, but ensured each had this level of polish, presentation, and intrigue. The case is centered on an individual named John Rumble, whose wife has died under suspicious circumstances. My dear beloved wife is gone. Abigail is gone. That's all you need to know. It was an accident, a terrible accident. 
I'll speak of it no more. For someone who just lost his wife, he's awfully nonchalant. An accident? How did she die? She fell. She went to the cliff top and slipped and did not survive the fall. Now, leave me be. You witness her ghost around their home, however, which indicates that she lingers with a purpose, so something about John's story doesn't seem quite right. In fact, the case initially appears quite simple. You find evidence that Abigail wouldn't sleep with her husband anymore and that there was a rift growing between them. In an argument, he told her to go kill herself and then she is found dead at the bottom of a cliff. Investigating the death scene leads to a conversation with Abigail's ghost, which, while informative, doesn't quite seem right either. Who found your body? Who told John about your fall? I don't recall, but does it matter? One moment I was alive and lost in thought, the next I was dead and bound to John. At the scene, you find a small hand mirror that is engraved with the name Ethel Bly, the wealthy matriarch of the family that the Rumbles worked for, and so this naturally leads the investigation towards the Bly Manor, the dilapidated house that has sat empty since the Bly family's death. Within, you find journals from Abigail detailing her growing fear, as well as from the former residents detailing their resentment and disdain for each other. Then this happens. I don't need you no more. What are you doing? <laughs> Foolish girl. Please, no. Please don't hurt him. <laughs> Whatever's in this mirror is neither ghost nor spectre. <laughs> Where is Abigail? Abigail has left us, my dears. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up during this scene. At some point, Abigail became possessed by an entity from the void referred to as a demon by both Red and Antea. The creature, operating through a possessed object, that small hand mirror found by the banishers at the death scene, targets couples and slowly cultivates resentment between them until it boils over. The Blys, Benjamin and Ethel, were also victims of this entity, with Benjamin eventually killing his wife through its influence. So Abigail attempted to rid herself of it by getting rid of the mirror, but when that failed, she threw herself from the cliff. Even this wasn't enough, however, as the entity remains within even her ghost. John Rumble is led to the manor and the final choice of what to do is laid at your feet. Banish me. Banish poor, sweet, innocent Abigail. Send us both into the darkness. You know well enough, Antea, my child. There is no ascent for Abigail now. There's no escape from the likes of me. Unless I grant it. I offer you a trade. A bargain. Abigail's ghost for John. Give John his due, and Abigail is free. This is a really interesting choice, and it's interesting because we already know that the hand mirror is a point of possession or doorway for this demon, and so banishing it can do very little long term to stop this creature, as it's just sending it back to hell. Plus, it's also sacrificing an innocent woman as well, just to temporarily get rid of it. Blaming John, on the other hand, also doesn't realistically make sense, because despite him being an asshole, I don't think he deserves to die and lose his soul for that. This is exactly the type of choice I wanted to be asked to make more, between banish and blame. The ending to this case is quite ominous, and while I was disappointed that there wasn't a fight against the demon and that the choice largely gave the same outcome either way, I really enjoyed it. 
Imagine my excitement then to discover that there was a follow-up quest to exercise the demon from the hand mirror in order to prevent this from ever happening again. A hundred years from now, that mirror will still be cursed. Unless we destroy it. Where should we start? Maybe a witch could help. The mission asks players to travel across the entire map in order to collect a series of specific ingredients for the ritual, which is annoying to do but was something I was willing to do because I was so interested in this quest and assumed it would continue at the same quality. I had assumed that the game wasn't wasting my time. I was wrong about this. I gathered each of the ingredients which required tedious amounts of traveling the big map and I returned to the Bly Manor to perform the ritual. It's fighting me. <laughs> it's over. Maybe. Hopefully. And that's it. No interesting payoff, no optional boss fight, nothing. As I exited the manor and made my way towards the nearest campsite, I was in disbelief. No way the game just asked me to do all of this for nothing. Why even have this as a follow-up quest if you're not going to do anything interesting with it? This is every haunting follow-up quest in the game, unfortunately. I'm not sure why the developers thought that each needed a follow-up, especially because not a single one had anything interesting for players to do or anything interesting to say. They contribute to the massive bloat problem that Banishers has. Despite this problem, what this haunting case gets right, though, is the haunting aspect. It's creepy, and in a game where suspense and horror are almost completely absent, it shines because of it. Unfortunately, the high quality of this haunting creates a stark contrast against many of the other cases found in the game. I want to list several of the cases I worked on my first playthrough where I ascended Antea. There's a case featuring a soldier and his dead former comrade. The soldier can't forgive himself for accidentally shooting and killing the squad mate years earlier, but the ghost just wants him to move on. There's a shopkeeper and the ghost of her assistant. The assistant lingers as a ghost because she wouldn't pay him the money he earned. She wouldn't pay him the money because she wanted him to stay and feared he would leave once paid. There are two greedy twins who screwed each other over looking for a treasure. There's an ale brewer who is haunted by a baker. Both wanted each other's specialized knowledge but weren't willing to pay for it and the baker thinks the brewer killed him so he haunts her. There are two women who are in love but pretending to be sisters because being gay isn't accepted. One of them unfortunately dies and there's nothing further to this, just helping them reach closure. There's a hunter who is being haunted by a racist hunter. This is the one my mind goes to when I said earlier about how this time period is actually horrible for creating complex and morally gray choices. The racist hunter doesn't and couldn't have any redeemable quality, so there's nothing to really consider here because he's a piece of shit. Why did you leave the safety of the fort? Exile. Captain Pennington exiled you. I exiled myself. Pride demanded I leave. That black-hearted bitch was a walking insult. No offense. Offense taken. You're full of shit. While it feels really good to banish him, it also isn't that interesting in my opinion. And that's the point I'm trying to make. Many of the cases are like this, where they have time period accurate ugliness, but because of that they aren't really thought provoking or interesting as a side effect. In a game about mistakes, death, and grief, none of the cases really have anything meaningful to say about those things. We're shown none of the characters involved reflecting on their choices, and they act the same after their hauntings as they did before. There's a case where a different shopkeeper was involved in the mass poisoning of an American Indian tribe whilst having a member of that very tribe working for him. 
Another has an abusive blacksmith husband get killed by his wife and her friend during the voyage to America. The friend has a criminal past and so assumes the dead man's identity and life to which the ghost is pissed off about. Another features the religious school teacher who deliberately starved his own sister to death because he believed it was the will of God. This one in particular is confusing because afterwards you get a follow-up quest to collect Bibles for him as if his enthusiasm for his religion wasn't just shown to be problematic. In each of these, there's a very clear person who is wrong, and so there's not anything to really consider. I'm not sure how you add more complexity to these either without getting rid of the details that make it accurate to the time period. However, Don't Nod does manage to do exactly this with one of the cases. On the way to Fort Jericho, players will stumble upon a ghost of a woman who misses her beloved, but can't appear to him for some unknown reason. How did you meet him? It was market day. I'll never forget it. It was rich, exotic, an abundance of treasures from across the known world. I saw him through the crowd. Our eyes met. I didn't know it then, but I was meeting the love of my life. I could not admit it to myself, not at first, but I had to have him. And in the end, I did. I included this bit of dialogue here because how it's presented seems harmless enough, but it showcases the occasional expert writing on the developer's part. The man she is referring to is Ferdinando Miller, and while yes, she loves him, he was also her slave. She purchased him at this marketplace, yet leaves that detail out. The investigation takes you through multiple possibilities, that he killed her, that he faked loving her back in order to get written into her will and then killed her, that perhaps she's faking her love in order to get revenge on him. In the end, she did love him, and while he faked loving her, he also didn't kill her. Love? <gasps> no. I told my master what she wanted to hear. I gulled her with a lie. I thought you a fool. But no, you believed me because you wanted to. Yet you didn't believe me, did you? Not entirely. That's why you never freed me. You're given the choice at the end, and slavery is despicable, but I also felt like the woman was more misguided with her feelings than malicious, so I chose to ascend her, and after that process, I got this reaction. She deserves no peace. She put me through hell. You don't care, Banisher. Just one more mad master in a madder world. And it stopped me in my tracks. It made me question if I had made the right decision or if I had been too easy on her. It was a great conclusion to a case I hadn't found particularly interesting up to that point and ended up creating complexity even with the time period. It gave me something to think about myself, which is more than any of the other hauntings did. The most interesting mechanic that the haunting cases utilize is a feature where depending on your choices with the leaders of each community during the main narrative, different individuals within the community will end up dying. The possible characters are always opposite one another in a haunting case, so it doesn't remove or add a haunting based on your choices, it merely changes who has the pulse. These are really cool in theory, and I was excited by the first one I did. There's once again another shopkeeper and her assistant, this time in the Harrows. On my first playthrough, Phoebe the shopkeeper, who had a drinking problem, died and was unintentionally haunting her assistant, Ishmael. The case revolved around finding out that Ishmael felt guilty for letting Phoebe overdose on alcohol and that he was particularly sensitive to alcohol due to his abusive previous master. Phoebe wasn't upset and that was that. On my second resurrection playthrough, I saw that Phoebe was still alive, so that must mean that Ishmael died and would be haunting her, but then during the investigation, it's revealed that Ishmael is very much still alive, which caught me off guard who was doing the haunting then. Turns out it was Ishmael's dead wife, a character who was only briefly mentioned in the other version of the quest. She was upset because Ishmael was turning to alcohol to deal with his grief. 
Despite differences in the scenario, the investigation of the case remained largely unchanged, however. You visited the same locations and find essentially all of the same clues. While I personally don't think that either version of this quest ended up being especially interesting, this obviously took effort to do and so should be pointed out. There were six hauntings that incorporated this choice variation, the racist hunter one, the brewer and baker one, the shopkeeper who poisoned the native tribe, the shopkeeper who withheld her assistant's pay, the greedy twins, and then the one we just went over, which unfortunately is the only one that had substantial differences between its two variants. All of the others kept the same general plot with no other additions, they just flipped who was alive and dead. Now, something that I think could have helped the haunting cases in Banishers is a mechanic that once again was present in Vampyr, that you could miss clues during your investigation into the side characters. Vampyr was oftentimes brutal with its clues, requiring players to find hidden notes in the environment, select the right dialogue options during conversation, and even recognize time and places to eavesdrop on the characters themselves. If you failed this, you could miss or be locked out of important information about the NPCs. Banishers, in contrast, forces you to find every clue. You'll always have the complete intentions for every character before you need to make a decision, and so there's no real chance for errors or making assumptions. One of the cases I haven't mentioned yet is a good example of why the current system doesn't work. It focuses on a pair of cousins and trying to determine which one is murdering people. The ghost present for the case is the father and uncle to these boys, and he is adamant that the nephew is the murderer rather than his son. This information is complicated, however, because the father himself reveals he was essentially a serial killer, and it's natural to wonder if the son is carrying that on. This is a really interesting concept, ruined because you are quite literally forced into finding every bit of information, and that it is in fact the nephew. It would have been more interesting if you could have made incorrect assumptions or misunderstood the character's intentions and easily arrived at the wrong conclusion, but that's unfortunately not allowed. The last thing I want to mention about the haunting cases is the problem that the blame route creates narratively for them. Why does no one in the communities, including the leaders, give a shit that I am murdering people? This especially breaks down in the cases like the abusive husband blacksmith one. If you blame one of the two friends, then you are still leaving one of them alive, and why would that person not report you? As far as the game presents, banishers aren't above the law, and it seems ridiculous that no one ever questions it. The one and only time the game handles this well is with the major choice for the Newsmith sisters. When deciding to sacrifice Thickskin, Red outright lies to the sister, making it sound like Thickskin is possessed and that he's cleansing her. You mean to kill her? I mean to save her. A malignant spirit lives in Thickskin Newsmith. And I will banish it. And that's it, that's all I have to say about the side haunting cases, however many of these complaints carry over into the cases that make up the main narrative as well, the ones involving the leaders of each community. While each in isolation is vastly more interesting than any of the side cases, the way they coalesce into the story of Deborah, the Nightmare, and the Curse of New Eden feels like less than the sum of its parts. That's my biggest problem with the story of Banishers. You're merely crossing things off a to-do list, and while some of those to-dos are indeed interesting, my lasting impression is that it was just okay. During the prologue, you are introduced to two of the three characters who are responsible for the Nightmare's curse, as well as the relative of the third. After failing to stop the Nightmare and Antea's death, New Eden Town is abandoned, and these characters, Governor Haskell, Captain Pennington, and the Newsmith sisters, all go their own way. The Newsmith sisters are capable hunters and lead a group to a makeshift hunter's camp deep in the forest. 
Captain Pennington returns to Fort Jericho in the Northern Mountains, and Governor Haskell heads up the community in the farmlands to the south. The rest of the game is about uncovering how these characters each played a role in Deborah's death. Doing so will allow the Banishers to bring closure, lift the curse, and ultimately get Antea's body back. Each of these leaders have a more in-depth haunting case that involves some higher level of specter that is targeting that specific community. Players work towards understanding what actions caused these ghosts, and they always tie back to these leaders. These are mostly cool ideas, especially with how the new crimes mirror what was originally done to Deborah. Thickskin not only deliberately lied to, but purposely got a second group of travelers killed. The journey through the woods was difficult, and to assist a second group, she gave them whistles to call for assistance should they need it. This was a lie. Unknown to the second group, these were actually dog whistles that would attract wolves if used. Thick skin is about culling the weak, and so saw it as only the weak would need to use the whistles in the first place. They stood by as individuals needed their help, and this mirrors the other Newsmith sister Kate's actions with Deborah. The pair loved each other, but Kate stood by as Deborah was falsely accused, charged, and executed for being a witch. The ghost haunting the Newsmith sisters is a scourge called the Beast, in amalgamation of plant matter, debris, and the corpses of those killed by the betrayal. Captain Pennington was responsible for accusing Deborah of being a witch and then imprisoning her. In addition to this, seven years ago he also made questionable decisions that resulted in many deaths. When individuals at the fort began getting sick, he quarantined any and all infected to the mines beneath the fort. He put one of his lieutenants, a man named Sebastian Priest, in charge of the mines, but due to circumstances which we'll get into in a moment, all within eventually died. We are introduced to both the ghost of Sebastian as well as his living partner Helen, who serves as a second-in-command of the fort. Helen wants the Banishers to investigate the mines and see what they can learn about the events that transpired there, which they do, and they find out two things. First is that Helen's husband Sebastian Priest was not the hero they all think he was. Serving as the authority in the mines, he abused his power which led to riots within and ultimately the sealing of the mines. Second is that the ghost of Sebastian that appears to both Helen and you isn't actually Sebastian, but rather a mimic of him being created by a powerful specter deep within the mines known as a puppeteer. It's using the tragedy of the mines to manipulate Helen into killing the captain for what he did to Deborah. The whole case is about identities and manipulation, things that Pennington used against Deborah himself. Finally, we have Governor Haskell, the man responsible for trying and passing the death sentence on Deborah. The governor believes his new community is plagued by a witch that poisons the crops and water source, but in reality it's a specter called an infamy that serves as a spirit of justice. Once upon a time, the governor himself studied demonology and the occult, and this was eventually used against him when members of the community suspected Deborah was a witch. His initial desire for a fair trial was discarded once it appeared he might be accused next. He judged Deborah for crimes he knew were false, or at the very least that he himself was more guilty of, and that his son was and still is guilty of. Yes, Haskell's son Lammy also studies the occult and is found to have actually performed rituals in order to further his scientific understanding. Having learned nothing from the prior events, Governor Haskell once again looked to incite a witch hunt. It tells the story of a woman, a teacher, living peaceably among friends, until there came a plague. 
In fear, the good people went to their governor. The devil walks among us, they said, and you must save us or we will find someone who will. This governor knew he could not save them, but he could give them a witch. She would confess or she would be judged. Deborah Comenius was a witch, Mr. McCraith. She was the devil's tool and worse, much worse. I have found the culprit, the devil worshipper, the source of the evil that has befallen your community. Sorry, son. <gasps> You're having a laugh. You can't be. Oh, that don't. Him? <gasps> My son, a witch. <gasps> You mock us, sir. Present proof or retract your ridiculous accusation. Now you need proof. For years, Lamy studied your precious library of the forbidden. But he outdid his father. He learned. It was Lamy who taught Caleb Watson the dark ritual that brought his beloved wife back from the dead. I was trying to help. I did nothing wrong. No! Lord of mercy! For shame. Well, he was always strange. No. No, Lammy is a good boy. I won't have it. Easy, Governor. Also, that fucking guy with his the boy was always strange remark made me laugh during such a serious moment. Each of these main haunting cases are interesting, but also feel like just a more in-depth and better written side quest that just so happens to also be slowly piecing together the main narrative for us. They also each unfortunately have the same problem as the side quest in that their big choice at the end to spare or sacrifice the community leaders carry no real consequences. It makes no real difference either way. If you spare thick-skinned Newsmith, Kate eventually runs away from camp and you are tasked with finding her. Doing so leads to the agreement that she'll come back if thick-skinned steps down and leaves. This results in Kate leading the camp. If you sacrifice thick-skinned, then she dies and Kate just immediately takes over leading the camp. If you spare Governor Haskell, he and his son are branded heretics. The governor is stripped of his title and exiled from the community and can be found out in the farmlands. His son, for whatever reason, is still allowed to remain within the town, and you even get a follow-up quest to help him write a speech to try and win over the town folk. If you sacrifice Haskell, then his son becomes the new governor and he just takes over. He also needs help writing a speech in this timeline as well. In the Pennington haunting, your decision at the end determines who runs Fort Jericho, either Pennington himself or his second-in-command, Helen Preece. Neither option creates anything interesting in regards to the fort. The exception is that if Pennington lives, then Helen will eventually escape the fort, and there's a follow-up quest where you learn that she is planning to become a banisher. While this one was actually interesting, I hope it's apparent what I mean by the choices not really mattering. You pick different outcomes, but they lead to the same world state. The only notable difference, like I went over earlier, is that some different members of the community will die depending on your choice. So the decision to spare or sacrifice ultimately just boils down once again to what you're trying to achieve with Antea. If you're trying to resurrect her, you sacrifice. If you're trying to ascend her, then you spare. I don't want to repeat myself here too much, but I wanted to offer one small example of the complexity I was hoping that I was going to get, but didn't from one of these decisions, the Governor Haskell one. In the clip I played a few minutes ago where Red reveals Lammy was the one studying the occult to the crowd, I thought I had condemned the son. In front of this unruly crowd, given what they did to Deborah without any proof, and the fact that Lammy admits his actions, Surely he was going to be killed, or at the very least imprisoned, but no, there are no consequences for the character. Imagine if there had been, though. In an effort to spare Fairfax Haskell, the governor, you are forced to condemn the son. 
Lamy himself seems a bit arrogant and self-righteous about his studies earlier, so this becomes an interesting choice about what is actually better for the community. After dealing with all the leaders, the characters are then able to return to New Eden Town to confront the Nightmare. The game features a plot thread running parallel to the main narrative that involves a witch named Seeker who is the runaway daughter of Captain Pennington. She's an apprentice to a witch named Ceridian who, because of a time loop phenomenon caused by the Nightmare, is actually just an older version of herself. Ceridian has an arch nemesis named All Saul, who is actually the specter of Captain Pennington. If it seems like I'm skipping through this, it's because I'm giving as much time to it here as the game does in its 60 hours. These could be interesting, but nothing meaningful is done with them, and I didn't personally feel like I was given time or a reason to care, really. The game reveals that Seeker was a kid in New Eden and was a student of Deborah's at the local schoolhouse. It's also hinted that it was Seeker's interest in the occult and then eventual running away that made Captain Pennington suspicious of Deborah in the first place. I thought this would get looped in in that Seeker would be the secret fourth person that we'd have to confront as she was the first domino for Deborah's tragedy, but nothing comes from this information. There's another rushed subplot about Antea's childhood friend, Calendry, that largely comes out of nowhere. You hear laughing in the void the first time you travel through it, and it gets a passing mention at around the halfway point, but then you fight Calendry, who turns out to be the demon Nazuku, because sure. This is positioned right before returning to New Eden Town for the finale too, which implies it should be some grand conclusion as if we've been deeply invested in this thread, but I wasn't. I didn't even remember the past references. It feels like it was originally probably a side quest that got rearranged and forced into the main quest at some point, likely because there wouldn't be a clean way of incorporating it given that all of the side quests have to relate to the NPCs and their hauntings. The presentation of what's here is actually quite creepy and could have been really interesting if given more time to breathe. When Antea was young, she befriended who she thought was just another girl, but who turned out to be a demon. Tell me, Rory of the Clan McGrath, when you realize you hardly know the woman you love, how does it feel to learn after all these years together these things she never deigned to tell you? The original design of Calendry as this creepy, shadowy child is excellent, and it's wasted potential that they replace it with yet another generic, lanky specter design for the fight. I understand not wanting to have players fighting a child, but there had to have been something more unique they could have done. And that's the main story. I found the game's bookends that take place in New Eden Town to be really interesting and would have liked to spend more time in that space as opposed to, say, the southern farmlands. The actual story of Deborah the person felt too small compared to everything else the game was trying to do. The endings were fine, Red either successfully and peacefully ascends Antea or he attempts the resurrection, with the success of that process being if you blamed enough citizens. That number is 13 by the way, you must blame 13 NPCs throughout the game for this process to be successful. Both of the resurrection endings have interesting and dark implications. If you are successful, it's stated that Red and Antea never recover from their experiences, murdering people and being dead respectively. It's also implied that they continue towards darker magic. If you're not successful, meaning you didn't blame 13 NPCs, then Red gets sent back in time by the Nightmare to try again, I guess. It's unclear how many times he has been looped back, and while that's interesting, it doesn't add anything meaningful. I also don't think that makes much sense from the villain's perspective because you're giving them another chance to succeed, but okay. I hope it is now understandable why I say the game story is fine, but nowhere near the level that many reviewers seem to be making it out to be. The narrative's most impactful moment for me came in its opening hour. I've heard your warning. You can go. No, I must remain. Esther needs my protection. My flock needs me too. You know how this works. You know I won't allow that. 
I am still myself, Antea. With time, I'll grow stronger. I can help you. The longer you haunt Esther, the hungrier you'll be. You know this. This is different. I'm the Reverend Charles Davenport, your friend and mentor. You know me. You know I am a good man. I knew you. You were a good man. Now you are a ghost, and I cannot let that stand. It asks if you think someone would still be the same person after they die, and I find that that is really the most interesting takeaway for me from the narrative and the game as a whole. There are these lingering shots between Red and Antea in the successful resurrection ending that made me question if she was still the same person, and it seems like even Red is questioning that himself. I don't think that was the point of the game because it does nothing else with this question, but it nonetheless is what I'll remember the most about it besides its gameplay, unfortunately. Listen, you don't pay a banisher to get what you want, but to do what must be done, and the beast is dead. Pay me. This portion of the video will be looking at Banishers, God of War 2018, as well as The Witcher 3, and I'm saying this here because there might be some who believe this section is too heavy on the comparison. That might be a fair criticism, but the point of this section is to illustrate how Don't Nod took the wrong lessons from both of these games, and that the game they released here is worse because of it. The developers have spoken about how the 2018 God of War game was a large influence on them, and that's apparent almost immediately. I want to belabor this point a lot more, however, because if you've not played Banishers, or if you have but haven't played God of War 2018 and its sequel, then you don't understand exactly how much of an influence it was. I want to give an additional warning here for general, non-narrative spoilers for both God of War 2018 as well as The Witcher 3. This is exclusively about the side content and gameplay designs found in both games. Let's start with God of War and Banishers. They are both narrative-focused with semi-open worlds that you traverse with a pair of characters, the one you primarily control, and then the secondary one who has abilities useful for both combat as well as exploration and puzzle solving. The semi-open world is a mixture of larger, open spaces connected together by narrow corridors. Both games are third-person action RPGs, with the camera located tightly behind the main character. Now, while not directly confirmed by Don't Nod, I'd like to extend this comparison to include The Witcher 3, which was almost certainly a source of inspiration as well. Both It and Banishers feature the characters investigating and solving supernatural cases for NPCs in the world. Players typically advance through these investigations by gathering information either from the NPCs themselves or from utilizing a special visual sense that highlights environmental clues for them to find. Despite seeking to help the communities they visit, in both games the supernatural professionals, witchers and banishers, are mistrusted by many. Rituals are performed, herbs and other natural materials are collected, and payment required. I look forward to never seeing you again. Don't count on it. It's not just narrative and world flavor either, much of the structure of the side content feels similar to The Witcher 3, with question marks littering the map to signify points of interest. These might not feel that unique to God of War, The Witcher, or Banishers, and even if they were, perhaps you're thinking, so what? Both God of War 2018 and The Witcher 3 are critically acclaimed, so if Banishers is like those games, then that should be a good thing, right? This would be true if Banishers had stopped at only copying the good things from these games. But they didn't. They copied many, many of the worst things about these two games as well, and I think as I keep going into more specifics about these similarities, it'll become apparent. Remember how God of War had those segments where Kratos had to slowly squeeze between two crevices, or slowly climb up a rock wall? 
Banishers has those too, all over the place. You will be sitting through animations of the characters climbing, squeezing, or ducking every time you need to proceed to a different section of the map. I understand that God of War used them as a way of hiding loading screens, but that was six years ago. It constantly interrupts the flow in Banishers and also feels like they are used to force players into engaging with the combat. The fighting arenas always had some sort of small ledge or downed tree that you couldn't interact with until all of the enemies are defeated, which becomes a fucking chore when you're just trying to travel to a faraway marker which you will always be trying to do by the way because the map is too big and the number of fast travel campfires is too small. Remember how God of War had an unnecessary equipment and loot system? Banishers has this too. Your reward for completing most activities is a new piece of equipment or crafting material you can use to upgrade your current equipment. None of these ever made combat feel any better or more interesting and were just stat boosts, which even on very hard felt unnecessary and unnoticeable. The equipment system as a whole in Banishers feels tacked on and like they felt they needed to have it because that's just what modern action RPGs have. Both God of War and The Witcher 3 were big on exploration, collectibles, and checklists. Question marks spread all over the map to pad their run times by inducing a sense of completionist anxiety in players. Banishers follows this almost to a T. It has these demonologist orbs that function identically to Odin's ravens and God of War. The spectral nests are the monster nests in Witcher 3 but now with extra steps. The totems that increase your health are the Witcher 3's places of power. There are chests found throughout all of the environments that contain nothing interesting, just like the Witcher 3. The treasure hunts are the artifacts from God of War or the hidden treasures from Witcher 3, take your pick. These activities weren't good in God of War or The Witcher, so why would they be good in this game? They are the low-hanging fruit, uninteresting and designed to eat up your time. I honestly don't understand who these are for. They are less egregious in both God of War and Witcher 3 too because those games both have enjoyable side content, side content that Banishers makes no effort to try and copy. God of War's best side content were the optional Valkyrie boss fights. These bosses had excessive health and high damaging attacks, but it was because of the uniqueness of the encounters that they felt special. They were an enemy type unseen in the regular game with unique attack patterns that required use of the player's entire kit in order to be successful against. They each had similarities that players could learn to recognize, but each also had different additions and timings. Banishers attempts a shallow copy of something like this with its Scourge and Elite Enemies content, but both just recycle the same few enemies and bosses from the regular game again and again, now with more health and arbitrary rules and restrictions added to the encounters. For example, these are things like certain attacks dealing more or less damage. These activities reuse two of the game's bosses, but there's only six to begin with, so even a third of them getting reused multiple times makes them feel less special and quickly becomes tedious. It sort of feels like the troll enemies in God of War and how they became overused and uninteresting quite quickly. Now, Witcher 3 is also guilty of question marks being vomited over every inch of its map, but it makes up for this fluff with horse races, fist fights, and of course, Gwent. I'm not saying that Banishers needs these specifically, but I would have happily traded any and all of the combat related activities for a Gwent clone. Part of the problem with Banisher's side content is that it relies too heavily on its combat. You have spectral nests that are just waves of regular enemies. The elite and scourge zones typically create mini boss encounters out of just regular enemies. And then there are the void breaches, which are a combination. They use regular enemies that now have passive healing and occasionally offer a mini boss in the form of a banished ghost from a haunting case, but of course, presented as a regular enemy, now with spongy health. 
Banisher's combat is unfortunately nowhere near as enjoyable as it would need to be in order to make this content fun. I want to talk about the combat's big problems, but first I recognize that I have been extremely negative during this whole section, and it would be unfair of me to not admit that there was one set of side activities within the game that I actually quite enjoyed. I want to discuss that briefly because I think it's important to give Banishers its flowers in the few places that it earns them. At several specific locations on the map, players will find what's labeled as a haunting ground, a series of large-scale and interconnected puzzles, sort of like an obstacle course, that once completed lead to a treasure chest. These courses use Antea's spectral abilities and the environment in clever and challenging ways, often requiring you to think about your positioning, speed, and the environment in ways that the main narrative never asks of you. The one set on the farm in particular is excellent, requiring players to figure out the proper order they'd need to dismantle the numerous creeping vine hearts while also throwing consistent curveballs at them. These would be blocked routes, wards that block your spectral powers, tight time windows, and requiring that a cart be pushed in order to have clear sights for aiming, they were all greatly welcomed for the complexity they added. There is a segment with a series of vine hearts you need to destroy, with two located inside of a house and one outside. The animation to exit the house takes too much time and had me stumped for longer than it should have until I realized I could see the outside heart through a window at a certain angle. These were genuinely one of my favorite parts of the game, and it was such a pleasant surprise when I stumbled upon the first one. There's also only four of them, so they never overstayed their welcome or got ran into the ground. I also think it's telling that Banisher's best side content is when it gets creative and breaks from its influences to instead lean into its own ideas. So let's now talk about the combat. I want to once again pull in both God of War and The Witcher 3 as points of comparison because in my opinion Banishers misses an important lesson from each of them that would have made its own combat much stronger and more engaging. The largest criticism about combat in God of War 2018 is its lack of enemy variety. It often felt like you were just fighting Draugrs with the occasional troll thrown in. It's something that even the development studio Sony Santa Monica acknowledged themselves when creating their sequel. After the last game, we've heard the community cry out for more mini bosses, bigger creatures, and enemy variety. And this time we really leaned into that. So in God of War Ragnarok, you're gonna be traveling to all nine realms, and each realm is gonna have like its own theme of enemies that are very unique to that space. So, with this in mind, it is baffling to me that Don't Nod took inspiration from God of War's combat, but repeated the exact same mistake. I'd even argue that it's worse here. The game only has two types of base enemies, specters and then possessed corpses. There's only a small amount of variety here, and I don't want to get accused of cherry picking, so let's go through them. With Spectres, they come in four variants, the basic white melee version, the fast blue ones that have a longer melee combo as well as the ability to scream and stun you, the ranged green ones who fire spirit orbs and can also place a protective shield on another enemy, and finally the hulking red Spectres who enter a rage mode once you've brought them down to half health. The possessed corpses are slightly different because they are essentially two enemies, the animated corpse itself and then the specter that possessed the body. So every time you defeat one, you must then also fight the specter. There are five different types here, a melee focused one, a ranged gun focused one, one based on a miner that can send an underground tremor projectile, one based on a farmer that can send an underground root projectile, and finally a possessed wolf. Also, there's a regular living wolf as well, I forgot about them. And that's it, these ten enemies will be the enemies you fight for 95% of the game. My first playthrough of the game on Very Hard took me just around 65 hours and it became quite tedious. That remaining 5% of the time you'll be fighting the same three mini-bosses over and over. 
There's a creature called a harvester that can swap between what damage it is resistant to, so either the physical damage that red deals or the spectral damage Antea deals. This enemy was really cool to begin with, but gets reused again and again until it becomes less special. The other two mini bosses are actual bosses that get recycled because nothing can only be used once in this game. The first is the Beast, that giant creature made of bones from the Darkwoods, and the second is All Saul. Even the bosses that do only get used once are uninspired. The puppeteer you fight at the end of the Fort Jericho section isn't a real boss. You are simply fighting specters and corpses until you can break the creature's chains and trigger a prompt. The infamy at the end of the Harrow's questline is just a clone of your own characters, which is unique but not very interesting. Calendry functions like the agile blue specters but with a ground wave attack, and the one good design is the nightmare, but that's likely because you fight her twice, once in the prologue and then again at the end, and so her moveset was given more thought. Mini games get by with less variety by having interesting encounter design, environmental considerations, or unique combinations of what enemies there are. Banishers can't do these because all of the arenas feel the same to fight in. All of the enemies feel the same to fight against. I'm not a game developer, but even I can clearly see that the game is just simply too big and too bloated. Why is a double A studio making a game that takes over 50 hours to complete when a triple A studio struggles to make that very thing flawlessly themselves? I applaud Don't Nod's ambition, but if this game had been half the size, it would have been a much tighter experience. The lack of enemy variety wouldn't have been as large of a problem because you're not playing for 50 hours. Focus on less overall in order to make each piece of the product really shine. The second misstep with combat is that it doesn't use the world and lore to enhance it, despite being perfectly positioned to do so. This is where I want to bring in The Witcher 3, which also has bland and uninspired combat mechanics, but what The Witcher does well, however, is in its build diversity and connecting its combat into the broader lore of being a Witcher. You investigate what monsters you're up against and learn their weaknesses. You have blade oils, potions, concoctions, bombs, and different sign spells at your disposal. These options aren't required in combat, but they succeed in allowing for different ways to approach encounters. The Witcher's combat could also easily become tedious. The various enemies and monsters don't require many different tactics to kill, but the combat is grounded in mechanics that make you feel like you're the character, which helps it stay interesting. A signs build plays differently than an alchemy build. Banishers is ripe for these same mechanics but doesn't use them. You get different pieces of equipment that slightly change stats but don't create a new way to play. You gain access to a handful of different potions and initially I thought these would do different things but nope. They all heal you and only offer passive stat bonuses. You have your sword and firebrand the whole game, but don't ever learn advanced abilities for them. You gain access to a rifle early on, but don't ever get any different ammo or mechanics with it. Antea gets new spectral abilities, which is a good addition, but didn't contribute to the feeling that I was playing as a ghost hunter. Throughout the game, the pair discuss the lore around different specters, but then your kit never reflects this experienced and expansive world of professional ghost hunting. I thought scourges were rare. Have you ever faced one? Once. A trade ship into Bordeaux sank in a storm. The slaves came back as a scourge. To banish it, I made 50 pounds of bane powder and shot it with a cannon. By then, it had killed the captain, and half the crew, and the ship's owner. Tragic, really. Banishers took inspiration from these games, but doesn't seem to fully understand why they were successful. 
worse is that in their copying, they didn't listen to the criticisms those original games got, and as a consequence, they make the exact same mistakes. But because they are a small team with limited resources, the mistakes stand out far greater. And listen, I understand that Don't Nod is a smaller studio, and it could seem like I'm punching down at them, but that's not my intention. Perhaps it's me that's in the wrong here for spending too much time on what Banishers isn't as opposed to what it is. There is just so much I want to like about Banishers but can't, and that's really frustrating to me. It's so frustrating that this is the first time I've made a video on a game where I feel more negative than positive. If you've watched other videos on my channel, then you know that that has been one of the guiding principles of my channel. I try to only make videos on games that I'm net positive on, and so that made me quite hesitant to do this video, as even here at the end I still have even more criticisms I could share about it. What ended up pushing me to do the video was again how much I want to like Banishers. These negative feelings were the big reason I purposely spent less time on the smaller things that Banishers gets wrong, the nitpicks you can call them. In a game I'm positive about, I feel somewhat justified in nitpicking because the intention is to point out the small, little things a game gets wrong despite how much else it gets right. The goal is to show how the game could have been strengthened. Conversely, spending time nitpicking a game I didn't like feels like low-hanging criticism, as well as distracts from discussing the core issues with the game. As I said at the beginning of this video, I hope Don't Nod continues to develop games within this genre, and despite my own personal disappointment with this game, I hope it does well enough to continue giving them more chances to do so. Thanks for watching. The next video will be a double feature on the Plague Tale games Innocence and Requiem.